Welcome to the Cambridge Tech Podcast, talking all things technology from the heart of the UK's tech capital. Here are your hosts, Faye Holland and James Parton. Hi, I'm James. And I'm Faye. So today's guest is Ben Pellegrini, CEO and co-founder at Intelligence. I've known Ben for a number of years. He first appeared on the 21's watch list a good few years ago. And also his other co-founder and CTO, Dr. Gareth Conduit. And so, James, as we started the podcast last year, back in October 2022, I actually sat next to Ben at a CW Founders Dinner. And we had a really interesting chat about what he was doing. And I just thought he'd be great to bring onto the podcast. Hi, Ben. Thanks for joining us today. So first question, what does intelligence do? Intelligence, I guess we're a, a machine learning company, a software company, really. And I guess we've got two key capabilities. One is a certain type of machine learning that is very good at handling a certain type of data, sort of that's typical in experimental or industrial settings. And that is where the data is very sparse or very noisy. And normally building good quality models from this type of data is tricky, but our technology enables that to happen very easily. The second piece really is now a enterprise software platform that really enables that technology to be rolled out in a way that's accessible, shareable, and manageable really because it's great having fancy machine learning, but if you can't get anyone to use it, then it sort of defeats the object a bit. That's great. So I think there's quite a few things we're going to need to pick up on there, but this is the first time James has met you. So I think James probably wants to find out about you first. Yeah, Ben, why don't we start with just getting to know you a little bit better. So what was your career path to get to the place you are today? You know, what your experience has been so far? Hi, James. Yes, pretty varied is the short answer. I went to Sheffield University 15, 20 years ago now, a long time ago. And leaving Sheffield, I got involved in software, software and data, worked for Oracle for a number of years, yeah. um, sort of across the globe. And off the back of that, I set up a small consultancy business based in Cambridge, been in Cambridge a little while, know a few people, did a few projects, which I enjoyed having sort of the freedom and variety to do different types of problem solving. More recently, I was CTO at another startup looking at sort of a big data type problem and then working for Public Health England. So looking after their um, cancer data. Okay. So yeah, pretty software data heavy, really, but uh, with a little bit of business thrown in, probably. Interesting. And I, I believe intelligence was spun out of the Cavendish lab. So that, I think that's the first time we've spoken to a startup that's come from there. Tell us about that process. You know, how was it formed and what was the kind of spin out process like? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, my co-founder, Gareth Conduit, was uh, working at the Cavendish lab. He was doing a research project working with Rolls-Royce at the time, came up with this technology and saw the wider application of the technology. So he wanted to spin it out. Right. He he took that to Cambridge Enterprise. Yeah. Um, so the department that deals with the spin out part of Cambridge. And at that point, I got introduced to Gareth through one of the entrepreneurs in residence there at the time, built that relationship with Gareth. And we sort of tried to understand the technology, its applicability, where it could work. And through that conversation with the support of Cambridge Enterprise, we, we formed Intelligence and really grew from there. I think, you know, Cambridge Enterprise is very supportive, you know, gave us a lot of tools, introduced us to a lot of people mm. uh, and made that process pretty easy. So, 2017, is that correct? 2017, I think, is the year we incorporated. I yeah. think uh, that first year, that first year was a little bit of uh, kitchen tables and lunch breaks and getting things in place, really. One of the things we did really early on was get an Innovate UK grant. 2017, we got our first grant. We might come on to funding later, but I think that enabled us really to sort of invest some real time and get people on board. So, yeah, I think we really got going towards the end of 2017. And what was it like having you come in from industry and Gareth come in more from the academic side? How did that work? The relationship I have with Gareth has always worked quite well. Those different perspectives from academic, what's the word, accuracy and detail versus, I'm not saying commercial aren't accurate or detail driven, but actually 
having a little bit more flexibility, exploring and understanding where things might apply. And it's not always an exact science. So yeah, there's definitely a, you know, a complementary skill set there to really enable that, that take up of the technology. Yeah, and I think we do hear that quite often as well. That and a lot of the investors want to have that, you know, both sides of the equation. So I, I can imagine that you you bounce off each other um, quite well with that. So let's talk about the growth. You said you got the Innovate UK grant, and then you're obviously in in growth mode. You started hiring people, and I believe you very quickly outgrew Barclays Eagle Labs, and you're now at Chesterton Mill. Chesterton Mill, yes. Uh, I've lived in Cambridge probably twenty years. Never knew there was a mill in Cambridge, so um, that was that was a, that was a nice. Uh, what did dis- it do? I don't. I still don't know. No, no, we need to know. I that, know. Though. I know. The, okay, you we'll can find you, out. You can definitely see it. So yeah. <laughs> look at it out the window. But yeah, I think it used to be an old printing press, perhaps. Not or... just making it up now, are you? Oh well, <laughs> a little bit. But... <laughs> Printing would make sense. We've got a legacy of print businesses in yeah. Cambridge, so let's, yeah, let's go with that. Let's just go so, with that. You know, we'll correct it in the notes yeah. if we need to. It's a very nice redeveloped industrial site. I think we were lucky to be the first ones in the, the newly developed building that we've currently got. First office space was in Eagle Labs. We, we started there with just a couple of desks in the open space. Eagle Labs, fantastic place to work really for, for startups like us to grow. I think I uh, can't recommend it enough. We started with a few desks, then got an office, a couple of offices over the course of three years and, and throughout COVID as well. So they really supported us through all those challenges around back to office, health and safety, took it all away, you know, enabled us to grow at a rate that was suitable for us. Yeah, it's interesting you say that, suitable for you, because I believe you've grown organically rather than taken the kind of traditional VC route to accelerate growth, maybe artificially. So talk us through that kind of process. Like, why, why did you choose revenue over fundraising? In the early days, it was very, you know, the technology is incredibly generic at a low level you can imagine it's a tool you apply to data and any data you could put in a spreadsheet you could use this technology for yeah so i think it was quite difficult to have clarity on what the actual end goal might be for a vc i think you know the technology was originally developed with rolls royce so there was a possibility around going into aerospace alloys but that felt a little bit too restrictive and um the scope for the technology was much broader. I think we've also had the belief we want to demonstrate value as quickly as possible. Mm. And we still do have really good mentors as part of the business. And they always believed in that as an approach, which was, you know, if you can demonstrate value to a business, then you will grow. That fundamentally means you're delivering value. And I'm not saying the VC route doesn't do that. And I'm not saying the VC route is wrong. It just felt for us, you know, we had a little bit of funding. We had enough to explore where we want it to go. It's always an option on the table, may come up in the future, I think. But at the moment, I think that organic growth model has has worked for us. And when, um, when you spun out of the lab, did you spin out with Rolls-Royce as a kind of, you know, cornerstone customer or no, did you start from scratch, essentially? Started from scratch, essentially. Right. I think the Rolls-Royce work was done through research at Cambridge. Okay. But I guess during 2017, where we where we were getting going, really, we built a couple of relationships. So we've had a, a reasonably strong relationship with a local software drug discovery company called Optibrium. And they really helped us validate the technology and, you know, a couple of key other customers really at very early stage where we'd work really closely with them more on a consultancy service basis to demonstrate the value. Yeah, I was going to ask you about your kind of your go to market strategy. Has it been more sales led rather than kind of like a, a product led approach? Uh, so it's definitely yet yeah, more sales led at yeah. the moment. I think early days, as I say, it was services, you know, consultancy, go and yeah. sit with sit with a customer, understand what their problems were, how we can address those and how we can deliver a solution. That process really enabled us to develop the product Alchemite to deliver the sort of challenges we were seeing our customers face. Yeah, and now we're at that sort of scale up phase. So building out the commercial and sales team, mm. it really is a sales led approach. However, you know, there are aspirations to make the product more virally scalable, I yeah. guess. Um, yeah. So whilst it's not what I would consider 100% product-led growth, we want the product to stand on its own yeah. and to be, you know, shareable and easily usable and all those sort of things. But, but generally, it's a, it's a B2B sales-led process. Yeah. So maybe just one last question. Sorry for hogging all the questions. In terms of the, I mean, how many employees have you got right now? Currently, we're about 32 and, and what's the kind of mix between, say, engineering, data science and sales, just for anyone listening that's kind of thinking about a similar approach? 
Yeah, so I, I think it's been pretty evenly split across okay. all three departments. I think you can imagine over the course of the growth, the sales team was probably smaller just mm -hmm. over the the last couple of years and now as we're flipping to that scale up phase yeah the sales and commercial team is growing faster than the science and the engineering i think we still have really strong relationships with our customers the science team like working with the customers and are always pushing forward on r d type topics mm. and the engineering team are always too busy so <laughs> i've got a list of as long as your arm features to do so interesting I'd like to come on to some of those features and talk about Alchemite a little bit. But before we do that, can we just do a little bit of a level set um, for the audience? So we hear about AI an awful lot and people have an understanding of that. What's the difference between AI and machine learning? Uh, good question. To me, I think AI is an umbrella term for intelligent systems or systems that are built to perform complex tasks whether that's software or robotics it's a it's a whole range of technologies and perhaps machine learning can be thought of as one of those technologies and really machine learning to me again is the ability to use algorithms or tools to learn from historic data understand the patterns and the relationships in that historic data to then use that going forward in an intelligent way. So predictive models, optimizations. There's probably a much more technical answer than that, but I guess that's how I, how I picture it. Yeah, no, that, that's perfect. Thank you. So, so let's talk a little bit about Alchemite then, if we can. So why is it unique? You know, you gave us a few examples right at the top of the podcast about, you know, filtering out all that noisy data. You know, can you give us like a, a scenario of how it actually works? Yeah, sure. So we're currently mainly focused on materials, chemicals and formulations. And if you think about systems that have ingredients and processes to make a product, so let's take concrete perhaps, uh, you put a certain amount of sand in it, certain amount of aggregate, certain amount of water in different quantities. And the process might be it's travel two hours in a mixing truck, it's a baking hot day, and you're trying to build a high rise flat. So you need a certain characteristic of that concrete that's created, it needs to be so hard, uh, has a certain slump, uh, and various other characteristics, maybe it's a cost, maybe there's a carbon footprint associated with both the travel time and the processing and the ingredients you're using. So trying to pick that best recipe or that best formulation is incredibly difficult, but it's also done by expert users really at the moment uh, with their knowledge and their history of what they've done in the past. So Alchemite provides a way of using the data to give some extra insights into that. And you can imagine that in concrete, it's, it would simply be impossible to test every combination of material, at every different quantity level in every different condition to then get the exact results you want to do. So it comes down to, at the moment, experts making those decisions. So, right, actually, I need it to perform like this. So based on my knowledge, I think it needs to use these materials and we need to think about this or processing to get it there. So Alchemite really helps with that. Given a certain set of materials, a certain set of processing conditions, can you achieve a certain set of targets? And that problem really applies across all of materials and chemicals. How do you make the best thing? How do you make it with... The the stuff you've got available, how do you make it energy efficient, use less energy, use less water, whilst always trying to make the best product you can. The application area is really broad, but it's the same problem across all of it, ingredients, process to product. And from a marketing perspective, it sounds like you've taken that step to create a product under the company brand rather than just market yourself as the company brand. That's quite a deliberate step. So do you see yourself getting more kind of specialized in different verticals with different types of products? That's a great question. So I think the product question for us at the moment is, can we create bespoke products for each vertical? And I think the answer is absolutely yes. And it's the same technology. And then it becomes a user acceptance, user adoption yeah. type challenge. Yeah. You know, if we had a platform that was talking about alloys, you know, perhaps a concrete maker or a polymer maker would suddenly think, well, this, this is nothing to do with me. Why yeah. are you show, even showing me this? Yeah. So I think we can create different versions of that product to appeal to these different verticals with the same underpinning technology. And you can hire in specialist salespeople that have experience in those industries. Exactly. And make the thing much more tailored. Yeah. So speak, yeah, interesting. speaking the domain language is really yeah. important. That's really interesting. Let's talk about GrowthWorks. 
It's the fully funded program that's supporting the leaders of ambitious growth businesses to scale and double their profits and productivity. If you're looking to take your business to the next step, GrowthWorks will support you to plan bigger, scale faster, and stay ahead of the game so you can deliver on both your financial and market share targets. Exclusively for businesses across Cambridgeshire and Peterborough, GrowthWorks is here to help you. Get started and arrange a call with them on www.growthworks.uk. So you talked earlier on about how Barker's Eagle Labs had helped you out at different stages of your growth. So you didn't have to worry about the admin maintenance of a building side of things. So that's kind of one lesson. What do you think have been your key learnings as a CEO in, in this business? I think it's all about the people. I think it's my probably key takeaway. Building a tech startup, scale up, whatever you want to call it. I think you have to get so many pieces in place. You have to get the funding. You have to have the technology. You have to have the team. You have to have a bit of luck. That's timing. You know, there's so many elements that come into play to enable that success. And I, I do really think the team is critical to that because even if the technology is not quite right, the time is not quite right. If you've got the right team in place, they will, they will make it work. I think we've been incredibly lucky with the team we do have to really help us with that growth. You know, if there are challenges along the way, I'm, you know, I'm not going to lie. Um, but I think, you know, the team is probably one of the most important aspects for me. Not to get too bogged down in some of the, the weeds, I guess, I think, which is quite easy to do on a day to day basis. You know, making sure you have time to step back and keep an eye on that end, end goal where you're heading. Because, yeah, when you're a small team, you get stuck into all sorts of weird little problems that shouldn't be problems. <laughs> so you emphasise team there. Really curious to understand what it's been like hiring in the Cambridge market, because obviously it's super competitive. Is everyone co-located in Cambridge? Do you have remote teams? You know, how, how does that kind of dynamic work? Yeah, so recruitment's a massive challenge, probably the biggest challenge we face. We've gone for a hybrid approach. So we expect people in the office three days a week. And I think that, again, that's really important for the team to get to know each other, to communicate and just build that culture and that relationship. I guess I can see the point where we're, we're going to grow. We've got someone in the US now, so actually that separation is going to start to happen. But I think whilst we can, we're going to maintain that team environment as long as possible. Recruitment managed to take on an HR talent acquisition person last year, and that's you know, hugely helped. You can invest a lot of time creating job adverts, you know, reviewing CVs, doing two-phase interviews. I think, you know, that's been one of the biggest successes we've had, really, which is, you know, making the decision to bring that in-house and get that support. If you buy into the fact that team are the most important asset you've got, then making sure you get the right team in in the first place is, right. is crucial. So I think that was a really good investment for us. And yeah, it's really hard. I think, especially from the tech side, early on, it's difficult to compete when, you know, you've got ARM and Apple and Microsoft and, you know, these big players in the space yeah. offering big salaries and big attractive packages. We just try to be upfront with people, fully accept that, you know, intelligence might not be the right pos position for that particular person at that particular stage of their life. But I think what we do offer is the opportunity to work pretty closely with some pretty interesting customers like NASA. The team have direct access to both that customer with their problems with some new technology. For some people, that's a pretty interesting challenge. Yeah. And, you know, if you can find those people that want that experience and that challenge, then they're pretty keen to get involved. I guess it's that, <laughs> it's that challenge of being in a, in a successful cluster. There's a reason people want to be in Cambridge, because you've got the, the workforce, but equally, the competition comes along with that. Absolutely. And, you know, I think we had a lot of thoughts about should we go fully remote, mm -hmm. especially before we took on Chesterton Mill get a remote workforce, it'd probably be cheaper, that your pool of applicants is massive. But I think, you know, we prioritise that culture and team for where we are now. Yeah, and I think that comes across a lot, doesn't it? Actually, companies that understand what their ethos and culture is, then you'll get the right people yeah. that come to you regardless. Okay, so my, I guess one of my final questions then, is this consortium that you're now involved in? where you're looking at applying AI machine learning more effectively in different industries. That sounds pretty cool. That sounds like a big thing for, for intelligence to be leading on. 
Yeah, so I think the trustworthy AI initiative, you know, in, obviously the UK government are investing quite heavily in AI machine learning right now. Bridge AI program is a sort of an overarching program to get more funding into these type of technologies. We have got a small grant to on a feasibility study really about how to make AI machine learning more trustworthy. And really, I think it goes beyond that. It's not just the trustworthiness, it's sort of adoption, education, deployment. There's a whole bunch of um, reasons why industry are not using this new technology. And I don't think it's specific to AI and ML. It's a new type of approach and people are wary of it and people have done things a certain way for 20 years. So why do they change their mind? We've managed to get a pretty good consortium together. Johnson Mathy, Domino, Goodfellow, Cambridge University, the Royce Institute. So I think we've got a pretty interesting proposition that's going to be coming out in the next three to six months. It tries to answer all those problems. How do you trust AI? That's number one. But, you know, how do you increase adoption? How do you improve education? When you're talking to scientists and experts, sometimes there's a reluctance to, for them to believe that data can give them insights that they've perhaps spent that 20 years developing naturally. So it's part of the thing of saying that, you know, it's just another tool. It's just another source of information that you should use to help you do your job better. Yeah, it's an exciting opportunity and hopefully can help put intelligence at the heart of that materials, chemicals, machine learning piece. It might just be a time thing. We might just be in a negative news cycle around AI. You know, certainly in the mainstream media, you know, there's been stories linked to, as you say, trustworthiness, job loss. And as news typically tends to do, it focuses on the negative rather than positive. But you must speak to your peers in the industry. You must be self-aware of that and you must be you know, is there conversations about how you start to readdress that and actually start to promote the positive side of the technologies and the the potential it has for improving efficiencies and all those kinds of things? Because I guess the concern is, and this is a very long question, apologies, uh, <laughs> I guess that, you know, if that negative news cycle continues, it is going to filter down into education and uh, the next generations might not choose AI or machine learning as a as a career path. There is a lot of negative uh, press at the moment. I guess because I'm in it, I perhaps don't see that positive negative spin. For me, this is just an algorithm on some data. I don't see where the negatives are. I think it's just going to make things better. You know, there's some pretty big challenges facing the world over the next 20, 30 years, net zero, global warming, you know, healthcare. All of these things need to be managed better. And for us to do that, we need to look at the data and use that to make better decisions. You know, some of the scare stories around AI and ML, you know, I, th I think are, are probably a little bit overhyped and, you know, people could use it in a negative way, I accept that, but I think over, overall the perception has to be we need to use as much technology as we can to address some of these pretty big problems the world is facing. Yeah, maybe it's the work of, like, the consortium to be out there to be explaining and to you know to be combating some of the hype stories that are out there but I do I do think it's a cycle that yeah. you know we're yeah. going through a cycle at the moment and it will eventually curtail a little bit yeah. um, but we've we've got to feed in the good stories as well so people understand you know understand that we're using AI and have been doing for decades yes. you, you, do you know what I mean context yeah. is that yeah. that all is that demystifying thing. isn't yeah, it is that, absolutely. I guess people's they perceive it as a black box and they don't understand how it works. Yeah. Therefore, it's making decisions and they don't understand it, which is no different to humans making decisions. Do you do you understand them half the time? I mean, you know, but, you know, I think I think that's yeah. the issue. And there is that kind of, I guess, that need for the, the industry to recognize and to yeah. address that. Exactly. And I think, you know, it probably only take a few big wins that, yeah. you know, I can definitely see on the horizon. You know, there was something on the BBC about a new drug with the materials and chemicals and the net zero challenge. I can see, you know, new materials and yeah. chemicals being created that Absolutely. are going to address that. It's going to be around and it's going to help. Yeah, yeah. So, so on that positive note, you know, where does the company go from here? What, what does the future look like for you guys? Yeah, so I think we're still, you know, continuing that scaling journey. I mm. think, you know, we're all about customer acquisition, customer growth at the moment. You know, launching in the US, we've got we've got one guy over there at the moment, uh, but hopefully we'll get a couple more by the end of the year. Building on the consortium we've already got, trying to create something a bit more um, far-reaching than perhaps just intelligence. How can we help the industries as a whole, not just intelligence? So I think that's pretty exciting. 
And yeah, and we've got a few other bits and pieces sort of in our back pocket, shall I say. New products coming out around federated learning, which is quite exciting, hopefully from strength to strength. Hmm. Watch this space. Oh, it sounds great. Well, thank you very much for coming on the podcast. And just before you go, I have to say huge congratulations for winning the AI Company of the Year at the Cambridge SciTech Awards. I was sitting at the front. I was cheering really loudly. Um, long overdue, in my opinion. So so very well done to you and the team. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Yeah, it was, it was really good to get some sort of external recognition. Thanks very much for having me. My pleasure. And now it's time for this week's news. So we saw the annual Ideas to Reality event at King's College put on by Cambridge Enterprise. They also released their annual review on what has been, it seems, a stunning 15th anniversary year for them. Indeed, yeah. Cambridge Enterprise come up a lot on the podcast and this is probably the reason why. They filed 304 patent applications, executed 144 licences signed a record 441 consultancy contracts and its seed fund portfolio has now got an all-time high valuation of 124 million it's invested a total of 10.6 million in 34 spin-outs just in the last financial year and returned more than 20 million to the university and its departments which all go towards supporting the development of an entrepreneurial culture and reinvesting in research and education so some pretty impressive numbers there. I might test you on those afterwards just to see if you remember them all. In other news, you'll recall a couple of weeks ago, I was one of the judges at the KPMG Tech Innovator competition. Our regional winner has just been announced. I'm delighted to share that it was a female founder-led company called Mimicrete. And they're an advanced materials science startup developing novel self-healing concrete and they're on a mission to establish it as a global standard in construction. So really interesting company against some very strong competition, so, so well deserved. And they're going to be one of eight finalists who go head to head for the 2023 crown later this month on the 24th of July. So we're going to be keeping our fingers crossed for Mimicry to take home this um, new title and good luck obviously to all of the finalists. And James, news from you on the Trinity Bradfield Prize. Indeed, it is that time of year again. Applications have opened for the 2023 prize. So if you are working on a new tech idea or life science idea in the University of Cambridge, please uh, check out the website. It's trinitybradfieldprize.co.uk. And just this week, actually, uh, Voala, who were one of last year's winners of the Helling Prize, at, uh, which is part of the Trinity Bradfield Prize, have just started a pilot of their bio bin at the Bradfield Centre. So really excited that not only are we running the prize, but we're actually directly supporting the winners of last year's competition. So it's going to be fun to see their bio bin degrading and turning all of our waste at the Bradfield Centre into reusable fuel. And I love there was actually Abiel Ma, he posted on LinkedIn this week um, because the trial, as you say, it's up and running. And there was someone actually leaning on the piece of equipment whilst doing a conference call. And Abiel's post was, we're always asked, do these things smell? Evidently not, because the bloke was just leaning on it. So I thought that was absolutely brilliant. And it wasn't rigged at all. It was it was very, very natural. So this year, there's £20,000 worth of prizes up for grabs. We've made a bit of a change this year, so every applicant will be uh, invited to attend four workshops around things like intellectual property, finding your first customers, business planning and pitching. So even by just applying, you will get something out of the competition. And then the applications close 31st of October. Great. So this isn't actually news, but I'm going to throw it in. So during the conversation with Ben, a question arose and we said we're going to go and find out what the answer is. So this is a test to James, whether he actually, he's got this most puzzled look on his face, face which is quite... This is going. Flower. Any ideas? Flower? What do you flower. mean? Flower. What? That's what the, happens at Chesterton Mill. It was a flower mill. Oh, okay. <laughs> we said we'd find out, so I found out and there you go. Do they still make bread or associated products? No. Or but just make the great, the flower. They don't even do that anymore. But they have this really snappy marketing um, pitch, which is about the grind. 
you nice. know so they're, they're pushing on with the grind, grind but in a different way so there you go that's that's the answer to the question and I really should, probably shouldn't have put you on the spot because you're just going to do it to me again one week <laughs> aren't you challenge accepted Today's show was produced by Carl Homer of Cambridge TV and supported by our media partner, Business Weekly. The Cambridge Tech Podcast is available on all major podcast platforms and on cambridgetechpodcast.com. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please give it a five-star review. It will really help others discover the show. 